Perlmutter, this cold chaos represents the ultimate destiny for time. This particular picture of the, of the future of the universe, and we don't know if this will be the final answer, would have time lasting forever. There will be no end to the universe in this particular scenario. It seems as if both religious traditions that I grew up with are in some sense correct. Time is eternal, as the Buddhists believe, but time also came into being at a precise moment, and that fits well with the story of Genesis. To the vastness of time that lies ahead, we begin to notice something truly incredible. As we move from one age of the universe to the next, we see that the nature of time itself begins to change. Time evolves. Ultimately, the strange and chaotic behavior that we can only glimpse inside the atom may in general become the nature of time throughout the entire cosmos. And if we could somehow hang around to experience it, we might not even recognize it as time at all. Because just as particles can be in many places at once, so in our quantum cosmos, we might uncover many universes, each one with a time of its own. So this new perspective of time over the whole life of the cosmos makes us look at our time from a new point of view. The time that we feel passing, the time that we know and trust, may be something of an illusion an illusion that allows us to make sense of our place in this tiny corner of the cosmos. Stay with BBC Four to see Ken Russell's TV dramatization of Lady Chatterley's lover, Jolie Richardson. Imagine somewhere in our universe an utterly strange world. A place where time could both speed up and slow down. From where we could journey into the past and the future. Somewhere time could even split in two. Incredibly, this is no alien world, it's our world, and it's all around us. Now for the first time, science is enabling us to see what for thousands of years has remained hidden. The true nature of time. governed by time. From the tiniest of cells to the most distant of stars, our entire universe is subject to the beat of a constant clock. And because time is everywhere, we think we know it. We know that it's regular and it moves in one direction. We know that it's universal and eternal. And we know that it never, ever stands still. But how can we be so sure? How much of what we think we know about time is really true? In this program, I want to get to the bottom of what time really is. And in doing so, I'll be challenging some of our most cherished beliefs. As a theoretical physicist, it's this hidden time 
that has always fascinated me throughout most of my professional career. I'm going to explore the very limits of our universe in order to uncover just what time really is. And in the process, I'll be revealing an astonishing secret, nothing less than our ultimate destiny, the future of the universe and the fate of time itself. Of all our assumptions about time, one of the most obvious is that time is regular. That a minute will always be a minute. For everyone, everywhere. Here in the Swiss Alps, I'm searching for something that challenges this assumption. Something that if time was as regular as we think it is, shouldn't exist at all. Well, I'm now 11,000 feet above sea level, and I'm out of breath, and I'm actually feeling a little bit dizzy. Now, the bad news is, I still have a ways to go to reach the top of the Alps, because what I'm looking for is something that becomes more plentiful the higher you go. And this is what I've come to see. It's a particle counter telling me that the air around me is full of tiny particles called muons that come from all the way out there. Muons are short-lived particles formed when cosmic rays from space collide with the upper atmosphere. But the big mystery is how they come to be down here on Earth. Because with a lifespan of just two millionths of a second, muons should only live long enough to travel a few hundred meters. And yet, here they are, after a journey of several miles, something that shouldn't be possible. So what exactly is going on? The answer to this mystery, the reason why muons can reach us at all, is so extraordinary that from the moment it was first proposed, it literally rewrote the rule book of time. Less than a hundred miles from the Alps lies the affluent city of Bern. In the early 1900s, this was home to a young German physicist who would change the way we looked at time forever. His name was Albert Einstein, and he's been my hero for the past 50 years. Shortly after arriving in Bern, Einstein was offered a job. This building was once the Office of Intellectual Property. It was here that Einstein spent seven years as a patent clerk, assessing the technical merits of inventions ranging from refrigerators to radios. One technology in particular had a huge impact on the young Einstein. Between 1901 and 1904, the number of patent applications for electrical clock devices almost doubled. And that's because time was fast becoming the issue of the day. 
This is the famous clock tower, which has stood in the middle of Bern for the past 200 years. Einstein must have walked past his clock every day on his way to work. But back then, clocks were so inaccurate that this one, and one in Zurich, a mere 75 miles away, would have differed as much as four minutes. With the growth of Europe's railways, such time discrepancies were becoming not just inconvenient, but also dangerous. Borne out by a steep rise in the number of serious train crashes. All of a sudden, time was on everyone's lips. But for Einstein, this new world of trains and clocks was more than just a talking point. It was an inspiration. In 1905, in this, his first floor apartment, Albert Einstein put the finishing touches to his radical new theory. Special relativity. One of five papers published by Einstein in 1905, special relativity would make us think about time in a completely new way. Einstein's astonishing claim was that time was not regular at all. It could beat at different rates. Time changes depending on relative speed. Imagine for a minute that my tram is capable of traveling at phenomenal speed, just a fraction less than the speed of light. According to special relativity, the rate at which time flowed on this speeding tram would depend on whether you were on board or looking in from the outside. So while for me, it would seem as though time was passing perfectly normally, for me, sitting on the pavement, assuming I could somehow peer inside the tram, time would assume a totally different quality. Looking in from the outside, I'd sense that time on board the tram was passing much more slowly. That's because, according to Einstein, the faster an object moves, the slower its time will run to someone observing from the sidelines. In other words, time can vary. It's all a matter of speed. And that explains the mystery of how our muons reach the Earth. Because muons travel near the speed of light, relative to the Earth, their clocks have slowed down, so much so that they exist long enough to reach the Earth and be detected. Time for our muons has stretched. It beats very differently to the way it does for us. For hundreds of years, time had been seen as fixed and immutable. None other than the grandfather of modern science, Sir Isaac Newton, had pronounced that time exists in and of itself without reference to anything external. But we now know that time isn't set at a fixed rate. Time is not absolute. Now, the effects of special relativity are so small that they have no impact on our daily lives. But the fact that they are there at all has changed everything. Because if time is relative, if time is flexible, then our belief in the immutability of time is wrong. And if we can be wrong about something as basic and as fundamental as this, then in what other ways might we be mistaken? Time has intrigued humanity throughout history. 
more than 1,500 years ago, a former heretic turned Christian bishop wrote a treatise on time that's as provocative today as when it was first written. What we have here is the first English translation of Augustine's Confessions. Augustine was a 4th century philosopher and theologian, and the Confessions is his autobiography. But besides relating incidents in his life, it also contains some fascinating reflections on the nature of time. And he starts with a very commonplace reflection, that time consists of time past, time present, and time future. But, says Augustine, the future does not yet exist, the past no longer exists, and the present takes up no time at all. So how then can time exist? Over one and a half thousand years later, the mysteries of time continue to preoccupy philosophers. But there's one thing most of them are in agreement about. Time is very paradoxical. It involves notions of eternity, of infinity, of beginnings and endings. All these are extremely difficult notions to grasp. But that doesn't mean to say that